We hear a lot of different answers when the conversation arises about the best trilogy ever made. You got the standard answers like the original trilogy, Lord of the Rings, The Dark Knight, which are all respectable answers, and I even agree about one of them. Then you've got the trilogies that have two amazing movies and a third one that's okay, but because the first two are so great, it balances out. I guess, but an answer I almost never see is the recent reboot of Planet of the Apes. Now in general, I think this whole franchise gets a bad rap, but especially with my generation. Most of us have only ever seen or heard of the 2001 Tim Burton version, up until these movies came out anyway, and even as a kid when every movie I watched was amazing, Planet of the Apes was just okay. So a lot of people write off this series. Some say it's super unrealistic and even a bit silly as a concept overall. And honestly, it kinda is. But the filmmakers set out to address this issue head on, giving us a reason as to why these apes could eventually take over the planet, and it has far less to do than these apes simply evolving past humans, but it's more so the incompetence and greed of humanity. What follows is a trilogy of fear, desperation, and amazingly enough, a lot of empathy. In this video, I'm going to be going over all three movies in this new trilogy, go over my thoughts on each of them, and overall why I believe this to be the most underrated trilogy of movies ever made. So grab your spears, hop on a plane to spread the simian flu, and beg forgiveness from Caesar for doubting this trilogy as we head into the world of Planet of the Apes. The beginning of this movie centers around the humans and the introduction to James Franco's will, trying to get approval for his project to solve Alzheimer's. He talks about all the experiments they've conducted on different chimpanzees and all the progress that they've made. All seems to be going well, until an ape runs rampant through the building and essentially slashes the hopes of this project being approved. But as it turns out, this ape wasn't just crazy, it was trying to protect a newborn baby. So Will takes him home, and the legend of Caesar begins. While this introduction has a very heavy human focus, this is really the only human-heavy aspect of the entire story. James Franco's Will is around for a lot of the plot, but the main subject of the story is Caesar and his climb to power. The first half of this film is like a strange coming-of-age story in a lot of ways, but it only works in the context of something that isn't human, but acts like a human. Kind of like, you know, an ape. We see a lot of the very typical scenes play out that are in every coming-of-age story, but of course there's a unique twist with the character of Caesar, so these scenes don't play out like they usually do. This is a trend that continues across the entire trilogy, and I'm gonna give it a lot of praise right here, and I'm gonna give it a lot of praise later on too. Caesar is is both the protagonist and antagonist at the same time. We root for him, but we're also scared of him, which makes this entire story super unique. It's a tragedy, and this movie is kind of like a prequel for all Planet of the Apes movies in that way, because it shows how this can happen, and the circumstances are more substantial than just saying, oh, the monkeys took over. Will is usually the type of character that takes central focus, even in movies like this. Like all the new Godzilla and Kong movies, there's far more focus on the human aspect when all we want to see is the big monsters fight each other. But the movie takes its time to develop Will's character and Caesar's at the same time, and after the first half of the film, Will takes a step back and a lot of the stuff that happens in his life is glanced over, like the death of his father and his relationship with Caroline. We know how these stories usually play out, this isn't a character drama of people surviving an ape apocalypse, so we can kind of skim these plot points while still caring about the characters. This movie has a stellar cast of both humans and apes. I think this is honestly probably James Franco's best role, maybe other than the disaster artist. Even with his limited screen time, we see his struggles and connect with him because at the end of the day, all he's trying to do is save his father. But then we have Lord Farquaad, William Stryker, Draco Malfoy, and of course, rounding out the cast, we have Andy Serkis playing Caesar. This movie is over a decade old, and it looks incredible. That's a trend that continues as well. The cinematography is super exciting to watch and really puts you in the shoes of Caesar, especially in the early scenes with the really long takes and montage sequences. But as time goes on, we still feel very much like we're right next to Caesar as he's going through everything. The most common complaint I hear about these movies 
isn't even a complaint about the movie itself, but people say that it seems a bit unrealistic that apes could take over the world. Like I said in the intro, this movie addresses that head on. This is a slow burn of a film that shows, well, the rise of the apes and how something like this could happen. Of course, there's a sci-fi element roped in there to make it all seem more plausible. The experimental drug for Alzheimer's makes the apes smarter than all of you watching this video and me making this video. And that's not a dig at any of you. For real, these apes have like IQs of 200 plus. They're way smarter than any of us. But their rise is not only due to their intelligence, it's due to humans and our greed and stupidity. Will realizes that there's side effects to this drug, but his boss says, eh, it'll be fine, this is gonna make me a shit ton of money, so I don't really care. Even after he threatens to quit, his boss says that they're gonna continue this with or without him, so it doesn't even matter. Will's involvement in the project came from a place of empathy for others, including his own personal reasons for trying to develop a cure, but just like any business, if something can make money, they're gonna put it out there in the world, even if it isn't ready yet. That's the true reason why these apes escape and take over, not because of their own wit and intelligence over the humans, but because humans are dumb as fuck. In the second half of the film, we spend far less time with Will and primarily center on Caesar's point of view. His time with the apes does such an incredible job at conveying what's going on and the hierarchy of power without any dialogue whatsoever. We feel bad for Caesar when he realizes what this place is truly like, so we start rooting for him to escape and then to help all the other apes once he becomes the alpha. Caesar gets the silver back on his side and then makes Rocket submit to him. All of these scenes of the apes getting smarter give you a sort of conflicted feeling because we care for Caesar and want him to succeed, but in the back of your mind you're also going, wait a minute, I'm kind of rooting for my own downfall here. Literally, I'm rooting for humanity's downfall. And this continues on into the third act of the film. The entire third act is this combination of horror movie and triumphant action movie, depending on your point of view and feelings towards the apes. But the film supports whichever way you want to view it. You can be horrified by what's happening on screen, and then you can think that everything happening on screen is warranted and that we deserve all of this for keeping these things caged for so long. There's also a lot of setup and character introductions for the future films of the franchise, clever nods to the original with the Mars mission and how it's lost in space, and many, many more. If there's one message to take away from this movie, it's to pick your neighbors carefully, because if you don't, you could quite literally be responsible for the downfall of humanity. But seriously, I feel so bad for this neighbor, the whole movie he's just getting the short end of the stick because he lives next to some crazy guy and his pet ape. I've seen this movie a number of times, but watching it this time has been my favorite time watching it out of all of them. When I first saw this in theaters, I must have been like, 12 years old or something, so the only part I really liked was the third act and the apes taking over. I thought the rest of the movie was boring, who cares about character development, I want to see the monkeys fight the humans. But I appreciate the pace of this movie now, I think it's an outstanding and super unique movie, both in terms of drama and setting up an apocalypse. I'm gonna go 8.8 out of 10 because it only gets better from here. The intro shows us a similar graphic to the end of the last movie with some additional context of what's happened since the last one ended. So if for some reason you didn't watch that one, you'd still be caught up to the beginning here. I remember being pretty surprised at how far things had progressed already by the time the sequel starts. We didn't get to see day one in the apocalypse and we're already right in the thick of things. Right away, I have to talk about the visual effects and the acting. The last movie looked incredible, but this one is on a whole other level. There isn't a single moment that I was thinking, oh, that kind of looks bad, or even a moment where I was brought out of the story because of the heavy use of CGI. All of this looks more or less real. It's absolutely criminal that they didn't win at least Best Visual Effects at the Oscars. What movie did win that? Interstellar. Oh, well... Alright, it's still criminal that not a single one of these three won that Oscar. Because you have a team making all of this on this budget, and then you have movies today that make this on this budget. These characters are so expressive and have distinct personalities, which is like movie 101, even though some movies forget that even today. 
but obviously because they're apes, it makes this so much more unique. The first movie addressed how apes could be seen as equal to humans, and how they could rise to power, but this one expects that you should already see them as equal, if not better. The first movie was directed by Rupert Wyatt, and he did a phenomenal job, but a little known guy called Matt Reeves directed this movie, and after seeing the Batman another time recently, and a few of his other films, this movie has his unique style all over it. And by unique style, I mean everything about this film is absolutely amazing. The vibe is obviously very different than the first film. I think the whole post-apocalyptic setting is really cool, but this does seem like a bit much for just 10 years. Maybe the virus also affected plant life and gave that accelerated growth or something. I can see that being the case, but if it's not, this apocalypse seems like 50 or more years into it. I mean, not even The Last of Us looked this disheveled. The relationship between Caesar and the apes is great, but in particular, his relationship with Koba is really interesting. At the start of the movie, they're like brothers, but as time goes on, that obviously changes. This almost goes to show the next step in evolution. The apes aren't just trying to be strong together anymore. Koba now thinks just like humans with their scheming and betrayal. Caesar is also a goddamn badass. He's such a superior leader, and maybe it's the apocalypse setting that's giving me the comparison, but Caesar's like the Rick Grimes of apes, which means that his son is called Carl, Koba is Shane, and Maurice is, I guess, Daryl. The humans in this movie are really in the reverse position because they have no power anymore. Literally, their whole plot is about trying to get the power back on. They say it themselves that the apes are superior because they don't need everything that the humans need in order to survive. But in this film, the apes and the humans are really on the same playing field because each has different advantages and disadvantages. The humans have the firepower, but are hanging on by a thread of hope for the future, and they greatly underestimate their enemy. The apes have the primal instincts and living conditions, but they don't fully realize the threats around around them. I actually like the humans a lot more in this film. Jason Clark as Malcolm does a really great job in the role as the kind of bridge between humans and apes. They have a much more prominent and profound storyline than the last one, where they really needed to emphasize that apes and how they could take over and even handle a story on their own. The apes are still very much the focus of this story, don't get me wrong, but I'd say it's like 60% apes and 40% humans, whereas the last one was like 70% apes and 30% humans. A lot of the Caesar's family storyline isn't built up because it says what it needs to and moves on, just like the love story of the humans in the last film. The rest of the cast is is stellar too, led by Gary Oldman, who I initially viewed as a villain when I watched this film for the first time, but this time I understood him a lot more. He is the last thread of hope that the humans have, and he's trying to hold everything together as long as he can. The apes attack, and he has no reason to believe that Caesar is going to change anything, so putting myself in his shoes at the end, I completely understood his actions because Malcolm seemed like an absolute lunatic. All of the personal drama on both sides is so captivating. Caesar and his teenage son disagreeing, so Koba trying to undermine him by turning his son against him. This is all stuff that we've seen before, but in the context of this movie with the apes, it just seems so much more impressive and unique. The very fragile alliance between apes and humans is written to perfection, and only the smart ones in the film realize that working together could solve all their problems, yet there's always the people who will cause problems, and the one thing that could solve those issues is communication, something we all seem to lack regardless of our evolution. One of my favorite scenes is when Koba plays up the dumb factor to the humans just to turn on them when their guard is lowered. It's such a brilliant scene of tension and horror, then his subsequent plan to get rid of Caesar and blame the humans just when everything seems to be going perfect is absolutely infuriating in the best way possible because it's great writing. The whole battle sequence is so well shot and tragic on both sides of the battle. Tragic is a very great way to describe this film. If things had gone differently, the apes and humans could have formed an alliance together, lived harmoniously, but all it takes is one person to start a war that involves everyone. This movie continues the trend set up in the last film where you can kind of choose which side you're on, and the movie supports whatever 
whatever your decision is. There's heroes and villains on both sides. You're not meant to side entirely with one or the other, and this battle emphasizes the worst parts of both sides. Also, that 360 shot on the tank is super cool. The movie has really great pacing for the amount of stuff that happens. The whole battle takes place like an hour and ten minutes into the movie. Koba takes over the apes, who take over the humans fairly quickly, but it doesn't seem too fast or too jarring in any way. Caesar's comeback and talk with his son actually got me really emotional. I was getting teary-eyed over two CGI apes talking to each other, then when Caesar watches the recordings of Will raising him, I actually was crying. The film builds up Caesar's return excellently, and when he gets to the top of the tower to face Koba in front of everyone, I just, I love that kind of shit. Especially when that kind of shit has proper build-up emotionally and delivers to a satisfying level. Name a harder line in all of fiction than Caesar. Weak. Koba. Weaker. This is the second act of a full, overarching story, and like most second acts, they end on a dark and abrupt note. Dawn is no different in that regard. We don't get any resolution for the human side of the story, which I get that because Caesar is the protagonist and this is focused on the apes, but with how balanced it had been, it would have been nice for us to see Malcolm and his family leave and have their happy ending too. This is just a movie that I am completely blown away by. I love apocalypse movies, I love the complicated drama between the characters, I love the cinematography and the writing, and I love the apes. I'm giving this movie a very solid 9 out of 10. So I'm kind of realizing that they don't expect you to watch these as if they're a trilogy with the amount of recaps they give you at the beginning of each movie. As I was watching this movie, I also realized that I don't think I had ever seen this one before. I was absolutely sure that I had seen all of these movies, but nothing about this movie was recognizable to me, wasn't ringing any bells, so if I did see this one, I don't know why I don't remember it. Maybe I fell asleep, but that's not like me, I don't fall asleep during movies really. So this was a really great experience to view this for what might be the first time. Matt Reeves returned for this film, so of course the opening battle sequence is masterfully shot. There's a great bit of misdirection when we see the apes and how they're actually with the humans. And we see very clearly that even though they're with them, they aren't treated that well. It's been two years since the ending of the last film, and you can see the toll that this has taken on Caesar. Rick Grimes is here! He's also even more of a legendary leader than he was in the last one, and you can see just how much he's progressed personally because he can talk almost identical to a human in this one. He talks with Maurice and says that he can't believe Koba betrayed them, but I mean, look at him. Look at Scar, look at Kylo Ren. These kinds of people just betray you. I praised the last movie for the VFX, and this one is just as great, if not better. Which is super impressive, considering this movie worked with a smaller budget. The inciting incident of this plot and the death of Caesar's family is heartbreaking and very unexpected. Sometimes you forget that this is still an apocalypse and there's a war going on. It also reminds me quite a bit of another plot to a very popular story. One that wasn't so heavily regarded, so I wonder how this will go. This is very much a movie about Caesar and his journey. While there was a mix of human and ape storylines in the others, this one is just 100% Caesar's story. The other two also had this kind of broad storyline of the apes taking over. This one has very little of that. This one, they just completely went for it by having an ape-only movie and expected that they had built up Caesar and his friends enough over the previous two movies that they could carry a story on their own, and I think that they were proven correct because they absolutely can. This story fully expects you to side with the apes over the humans, the aspects of the other two that allow you to see both sides is gone here. It's very cut and dry, the apes are the good guys and the humans are the bad guys. There's some nuance lost in that process, but I don't really take issue with it personally because at the end of the day, I was always rooting for the apes. When the apes go after Caesar, it really reminds you just how far these characters have come together, and I know I keep on repeating this, but it's incredible how much character development and personality they can convey through these CGI apes to make us care about them this much. You can say that caring about them is the same thing as caring about animals in a Disney movie or the Avatar people, but it's completely different. 
this is a drama that's treated ultra seriously and the very concept of apes taking over and holding a dramatic war movie on their own is silly. None of this should work, but it does on every level. The new characters introduced are great and gives time for all of them to get properly acquainted because this movie follows a singular storyline. Bad Ape, which is the name for this lovable and hilarious guy right here, so I'm not calling him that, I'll be calling him Green Eyes, is mainly the comedic relief of the film, but his presence is also very intriguing and mysterious. He wasn't part of Caesar's group, yet he can still talk and he's intelligent, so it makes you wonder what other apes are out there and how the virus have affected them over the years. And this was exactly what Matt Reeves intended, to make you question the broader world and wonder what else is out there. There's also this additional mystery aspect to the film that wasn't in the first two. There's, of course, Green Eyes and the other apes out there, but there's the humans who can't speak anymore, and these soldiers coming from the north that are built up. I love me a good mystery, so I found all of this really captivating. Even though the movie was already pretty dark, the twist of all the apes getting captured is absolutely heartbreaking. While there's a lot of dark stuff that happens thematically in the first two films, this is certainly the darkest story of the three. Stuff like Caesar getting captured and having no one approach him makes him realize just how selfish he was for abandoning them. Even when there's a moment of hope and happiness, it's swiftly shattered like a second later. Caesar has visions of Koba at his darkest times, but it's always followed by the importance of family and keeping on going shortly after. The only prominent human roles in this film are Woody Harrelson's Colonel and Gabriel Shavaria's Preacher. That's it, which is far different from the star-studded human cast of the previous two. The Colonel is a dark character, but there's a lot of parallels between him and Caesar. They have similar tactics when it comes to their leadership, they both have let prisoners go to send a message, they both want what's best for their own kind and will stop at nothing to achieve that, but what makes them different is their methods of mercy. They even talk about mercy and how they have different definitions of the word, and a lot of this conversation makes Caesar realize his wrongdoings over the course of the movie. They are two very different leaders, but Caesar was losing his empathy and his mercy, but he eventually proves that he wasn't too far gone. This movie can kind of drag during the second act. It's very hard to watch Caesar and the apes at their lowest point for like over a half hour with very little hope to support them, but once Green Eyes, Maurice, Rocket, and Nova get involved and the escape plan is set in motion, the movie picks back up. This is when we get to see what must be the dumbest patrol guards in the history of cinema. They don't see Nova walking around, or the baby monkeys crawling around on the wires, or even notice when all the apes are leaving and gone. But overall, it's a really tense sequence that flows very well into the final battle. Caesar continuing to show that his vengeance outweighs the needs of his people was infuriating, and I was sure that this would lead to his death, and it does in a way, but this is also how he shows that his mercy prevails over his wrath. There's a lot of great misdirection in this battle. It seemed like the whole story was setting up Preacher to switch sides in the end to the point that it was almost too obvious, but this doesn't end up being the case, and I really loved that. It seemed that Red was the ape that was too far gone, but he's the one that gets redeemed and prolongs Caesar's life. The Colonel dying not from a showdown with Caesar, but from the disease that he was so scared of is sweet justice, and even the whole avalanche just comes out of nowhere. In the end of the story, it shows that the apes take over not because of their win of the war against humans, but because the humans took out themselves, similar to how this whole apocalypse started in the first place. The ending itself is incredibly bittersweet. Caesar and Maurice's talk had me teary-eyed. I love how the camera pans up just as the apes are approaching Caesar, realizing that he's dead, but we don't get to see that. This movie was from Caesar's perspective, and we only get to see what he saw, the apes in their new home. It's an incredibly beautiful ending to a phenomenal trilogy. Overall, I can see why this is the lowest rated one, because it wasn't what people expected, but I actually think that this comes from the title War. Everyone was expecting the opening scene and stuff like that to carry on throughout, but this is more metaphorical when it comes to war. It's their war for survival, not their war against humans. I honestly think that if this one was called, like, Survival of the Planet of the Apes or something else, people would have went in with different expectations, but that's an even longer title to a series that 
already has incredibly long titles. This is a very dark story, and it's definitely not the most fun to watch, especially when you compare it to the first two. But I think this one also has more comedy than the other two, so it kind of balances out. This story is like a better version of The Last of Us Part Two, and I'm one of the people who love that game. Would have been cool to see an appearance from Malcolm or something like that, but this is the end to Caesar's story, and it was fully centered on his development. Matt Reeves also said that the Colonel killed Malcolm off screen when he tried to convince him that Caesar and the apes could be trusted. This is a different movie from the first two in a lot of ways, and similarly to The Last of Us Part Two, it's not for everyone. But for the people it is for, they're gonna really like it, and they're gonna think it's worth it. I am one of those people, so this movie is a 9.4 out of 10. Rating each of these movies has been very hard. I have my own unique system for how I rate movies. Some people don't really like it or don't understand it, but it's how I've rated every movie I've watched for a number of years now. And this is the first trilogy that has really kind of made me rethink this rating system. And I think that's because of how unique each film is. The first one is a slow burn drama, the second is mostly an action film, and the third is a character piece. I think that the third one is the best movie, but I like the second one the most, and I think that the first one has the most concrete story out of all of them. So if you're mad about my ratings, just know that I am too, and any day of the week, any one of these could be my favorite, which is similar to how I feel about my actual favorite trilogy of movies. There's a ton of behind the scenes footage for all three of these movies that is just incredible to watch. I'd honestly watch versions of the movie without all the visual effects added in there, because watching all these actors work and perform these characters is equally as captivating in my eyes. It also goes to show just how special these films were. This all could have been done in front of a green screen somewhere, but it wasn't. All these actors, led by Andy Serkis, put in so much time and effort to learn how to walk like apes, how to talk and communicate, and I cannot give them enough praise for this performance. I just wish they got more praise from actual important people, not just me. There's also a ton of references throughout the trilogy to older Planet of the Apes films. Matt Reeves is either a huge fan, or did his homework, or both, because just researching the trivia of these movies, there's so much that went over my head because I've never seen those movies. Like I said earlier, I saw the Mark Wahlberg one as a kid, and that sucked. There's probably a few hardcore Planet of the Apes fans watching this who are disappointed I didn't point out each reference, but I plan on watching the older movies now, so if this video does well enough, maybe I'll save that for a future video. At the end of the day, these movies are all about the story of Caesar, and subsequently the legacy that he leaves behind. In the first movie, Caesar just wants a family, plain and simple. He has that family for a while, but as he gets older, he starts to question who he is and where he came from, and realizes that ultimately his own kind doesn't have it nearly as good as he does, both in terms of living situations and as an intellectual. When he gets transported to the wildlife center or the jail, Caesar's human instincts kick in and he tries to emulate his surrogate father Will. He wants what's best for his own kind, for them to become his own family, and to do that he needs to become the leader that they can all look up to. So he finds a way to become the new alpha, and finds a way to make all of them just as smart as he is. In exchange for their newfound intelligence, the apes start following Caesar, and he tries to save as many apes as he possibly can during all the times in his life he had encountered his own kind. It would have been so easy for him to look at humans and say, they're all bad just like Koba did, but even after being abandoned by his father, Caesar lets him go, proving that his own instincts and empathy are what set him apart from others. And this works out great for him for a number of years, and if there weren't any humans that were immune to the virus, Caesar probably would have ruled until the end of his days, gathering apes to live harmoniously together, and everything would have been fine. But that's not what happened. Caesar's empathy ultimately turns his own brother against him, Koba has a hatred for humans that he can't get over and forces him to take drastic action. Caesar tries his best to keep the peace between everybody, but with his own apes undermining him, it makes it impossible. So Caesar ultimately does what he has to do in order to gain the respect of his people back and install order once again. But then he's left with the unfortunate aftermath of actions that he didn't make. 
So Caesar ultimately does what's best for his people, even if that means fighting in a war he didn't start. But once again, it's his own humanity that proves to be the downfall. His need for revenge against the colonel outweighs the needs and wants of his people, and it gets all of them into trouble as a result. Would the outcome have been different if Caesar was with them? Maybe, probably not, but with all the apes united under their leader, the circumstances could have also been far different. Apes together strong. Even in his darkest moments, Caesar finds a way to remain hopeful, even if it's his own people that give him that strength to go on, which is another great mark of a leader. You can't do everything yourself. Sometimes you need help and to rely on others, and that's okay, it doesn't make you any weaker or any less of a person or leader. Eventually, Caesar fulfills his promise to his people and gets them to the Promised Land, the place that they could call their forever home, and with his job done, he feels like he can move on. I also love the development of the side characters over the course of the trilogy. Maurice has always been Caesar's right-hand man, he's the first one to talk to Caesar, and the last one to talk to Caesar. Rocket was bullying Caesar when they first met, and then ultimately goes out of his way to join Caesar on his journey, even almost sacrificing himself to save Caesar and the other apes. Koba is, of course, a strange one, because at the end of Rise, they're basically on the same page. The beginning of Dawn, their brothers, but their fundamental difference of views on humans turns Koba against him and leads to his death. There's also the other characters, like his son Blue Eyes and their typical teen and parent dynamic, Luca and Duke the Gorillas, Red and Lake, all these different dynamics are incredibly developed and interesting to watch unfold. A huge theme throughout this trilogy is, of course, evolution. In Rise, it's very reminiscent of modern day. You see all those videos of apes and zoos and how smart they are and you feel really bad about everything going on. We don't see any experiments or anything like that, but I'm sure that stuff actually happens and it's tragic. Honestly, if something like the bridge happened in real life, and I don't know, if nobody died or anything, I'd be super happy for the apes getting to live peacefully, because we clearly can't even let them do that. So in Rise, humans are very clearly top dog, while the apes are largely held captive and underestimated. The virus changes all of that, which leads us to Dawn. Similar to the different storylines, I feel like the apes have slightly overcome humans in like a 60-40 scenario, but like I said earlier, they each have their own advantages and disadvantages. Ultimately, I think the film ends with the apes not necessarily being more evolved, but better off, because while both humans and apes lost their homes, the apes can adapt to this world far better than the humans can. Across both of these first two movies, I said that they give you the opportunity to root for either the humans or apes, or both to some extent, but regardless of what happens in each movie, how much you care for Will or Charles or Malcolm, we all know where this ends. The apes win out in the end, and we see that not all apes are Caesar and that could and does spell trouble for the future. So it makes these first two films pretty thematically dark, knowing that whatever they do, no matter how good they are, it doesn't end well for humanity. In the third film, it seems, for the most part, the humans have the upper hand once again. It's difficult to tell because of the introduction of green eyes and the possibility of other apes out there, but for Caesar and our group of apes, things aren't the greatest. But I also think this is the film that deals with the theme of evolution the heaviest. The virus has mutated and evolved to the point that it's not even allowing humans to speak anymore. And on the flip side of that, you have Caesar and Green Eyes who are now able to talk almost at a human level. The evolution has completely flipped, and the apes are now starting to become more human than humans are, which sets up the future quite well. Overall, I think what these movies show is, while there might be a bad egg or two thrown in there, the apes feel more civilized than humans do because all they want is what's best for each other and to be free. This is far different from the humans we see in these movies, especially in Rise, which is supposed to mimic our world. Doesn't matter if the drug isn't totally safe, send it out there so I can make my money. In that sense, these movies feel ultra-realistic, that we will be our own downfall and a species we consider to be more primitive and undeveloped will rise and take our stead as the dominant species. 
that even if that starts happening, we'll still be too focused on fighting each other or scared of the change to do anything to stop it. That's why it becomes so easy to root for Caesar and the apes in the third movie. We can see this being the situation we get ourselves into, and if we're incapable of coming together to stop it, we don't deserve to be the dominant species anymore. Up next, we have Kingdom of the Planet of the Apes set 300 years after war, which seems insane. Considering it's coming out soon, or maybe it's out depending on when you're watching this, I'm not going to go into any theories or anything like that, but it's said that this could be the start of a new trilogy of films, ultimately leading us back to where Planet of the Apes started, and we could be getting another remake of that too. Could these movies continue on and on, and they redo the other sequels? Yeah, they could, especially if these continue to turn out like this trilogy and that quality continues on, but I don't want there to be a new one of these every year. I don't want a TV show that ties into anything, and I like that they've given this series time to breathe before releasing another movie. In an age where popular and lucrative franchises are being oversaturated, Planet of the Apes stands out. They've given us an appropriate amount of time to mourn the loss of Caesar. It doesn't seem too tall of a task now to release a movie without him. I'm far more excited for Kingdom than I have been for any movie of any franchise that's been oversaturated as of the past couple years. Even if this ends up not being as great as the previous films, I will always defend these movies from any naysayers. If you haven't seen it and you watched this whole video for some reason, I'd still encourage you to watch it. Until this trilogy gets the praise it deserves, I will continue to believe that these three movies make up the most underrated movie trilogy of all time. Yeah.